three years to reduce our forces in Afghanistan and to transfer security responsibilities to the Afghan government. That is what this amendment does, and I encourage every colleague to support it. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor and note the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. Madam President. The Senator from Arizona. I ask unanimous consent for the proceedings on the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. I oppose this amendment for one simple reason. It requires the President to submit a plan to Congress for an accelerated drawdown from Afghanistan. An accelerated withdrawal. Not just the withdrawal that's already planned, not the withdrawal that's already been accelerated on several occasions but a new accelerated drawdown. Now, the President is supposed to submit a plan to Congress for an accelerated drawdown from Afghanistan. Now, does that mean that the Congress of the United States could see a plan for an accelerated uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan? Is it required that it be implemented by Congress? Or is it a nice informational, notional kind of thing? Here's a plan. Hey, let's get together. I've got a plan. And, our, and the President's drawdown plan, which our senior military commanders have stated is already, already more accelerated than they're comfortable with. So, first of all, I don't get the point of the Senator's amendment, which is to submit a plan. It doesn't require that the plan be acted on, just, just a plan. I can submit a plan for him if, if, if it's plans that he's interested in. But the fact is that we are accelerating our withdrawal from Afghanistan at great risk, as our military commanders have testified, much greater risk. So I guess another accelerated plan would obviously have the result of even greater risk to the men and women in the military. I understand the senator from Oregon's uh, opposition to the war. That's fine. I, I respect that. But an amendment that a plan is to be submitted without any requirement that it be implemented, a plan which would already accelerate more what has already been accelerated, uh, I guess is some kind of statement. The plan is required by this amendment would be based on inputs from our military commanders. I can tell the senator from Oregon what our military commanders in Afghanistan have said in testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee that more acceleration would mean greater risk. The acceleration that's already taking place means greater risk. But the senator from Oregon wants a more accelerated plan, I guess. And then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, testified before the House Armed Services Committee on June 23rd, this is the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, with the President's drawdown plan. That's the present plan, not an accelerated plan such as the amendment proposes. Well, quote, would be, quote, the President's drawdown plan would be, that's the present one, quote, more aggressive and incur more risk than I was originally prepared to accept. Now, I, I wonder if the Senator from Oregon heard that. The present plan is, quote, more aggressive and incur more risk than the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff would have said, would have been prepared to accept, unquote. So now, this amendment, we accelerate even more. On the same day, in testimony before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, General David Petraeus stated that no military commander recommended what the president ultimately decided. That's the present plan. Their concerns were well-grounded. Our commanders had wanted to keep the remaining surge forces in Afghanistan until the conclusion of next year's fighting season, which roughly occurs with the onset of the colder months. That was their recommendation to the president. So now they, uh, the president shall devise a plan based on inputs from military commanders. I can tell the senator from Oregon what the input from the military commanders are. They're the same input that he got with the first accelerated 
withdrawal. All you have to do is pick up the phone and ask them. We don't have to have an amendment. That uh, this was recommend, their recommendation of the president. However, the president chose to disregard that advice and announced that all U.S. forces would be withdrawn from Afghanistan by the end of next summer. That guarantees that just as the fighting season next year is at its peak, U.S. surge forces will be leaving Afghanistan. In my view, that's a huge and unnecessary risk to our mission. But the decision has been made. I think there will be great long-term consequences to it. A story was related to me just recently. A former member of the previous administration, high-ranking, in a meeting with one of the highest-ranking members of the government of Pakistan. He said to this high-ranking government official, what do you think the chances for peace with, that, with the Taliban are? That individual just laughed and said, why should they make peace? You are leaving. Those are fundamental facts. The primary reason for maintaining all of our surge forces in Afghanistan through next year's fighting season is because of another time the president chose to disregard the advice of his military commanders. It's well known that our military leaders had wanted a surge to be 40,000 U.S. troops, but the president only gave them 33,000. So rather than being able to prioritize the south and east of Afghanistan at the same time as they had planned, our commanders had to focus first in the south, which they did last year and this year, and then concentrate on eastern Afghanistan next year, all because they didn't have enough troops. Now that's not my opinion, that is the sworn testimony of military leaders before the Senate Armed Services Committee. The President's decision made the war longer, and now our commanders will not have the forces they said they wanted and needed to finish the job in eastern Afghanistan. So before we can mandate a plan to further accelerate the drawdown of U.S. forces from Afghanistan, I suggest we review the facts and consider the potential consequences of the overly accelerated drawdown we already have. Before we base such a plan on the views of our military commanders, I certainly recommend that my colleagues travel to Afghanistan and speak with those commanders who can explain far better than I can why further accelerating our drawdown is reckless and wrong. So, so Madam President, uh, I don't get the amendment. I don't understand why the title of it, to require a plan for the expedited transition of responsibility for military and security operations in Afghanistan to the government of Afghanistan. As I said, in case the senator from Oregon missed it, we have already accelerated. And in the view of our military commanders, unanimously, it's far greater risk. And so the president shall devise a plan, it says, devise a plan based on inputs from military commanders, NATO and coalition allies, uh, and diplomatic missions in the region, and appropriate members of the cabinet, along with the consultation of Congress, for expediting the drawdown of United States combat troops in Afghanistan and accelerating the transfer of security authority. Apparently, the senator from Oregon uh, is not satisfied with the president's already accelerated uh, plan for withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, beginning in the fall of, uh, uh, well, it's already begun, but the serious withdrawal in the fall, September of 2012. Uh, and I can assure, I can assure the senator from Oregon that if our withdrawal, which I greatly fear now, will have long-term consequences, a further accelerated withdrawal will absolutely guarantee that Afghan becomes a cockpit, a cockpit of competing interests from Iran, from India, from Pakistan, from other countries in the region. And I think that the people of Afghanistan deserve better. So um, I uh, will obviously oppose this amendment. The clerk will call the roll.
Madam President. The Senator from Utah. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that the current amendment be set aside so that I might speak briefly uh, regarding amendment number 1126. Madam the President, question. reserving the right to object, I, I wonder if the Senator would just seek the uh, right to... Uh, the Senator has a right to speak on another amendment without setting aside this amendment. So I ask that the Senator not set aside the pending amendment, but just simply speak on whatever amendment he wishes to speak. Wonderful. The second request is withdrawn. Without objection. Madam President, I rise today to speak in support of Amendment Number 1126 to the current pending legislation. The purpose of this amendment is to make clear that the United States shall not detain uh, for an indefinite period U.S. citizens in military custody. I understand that this has been the subject of a lot of debate. I also understand that this would be a break not only with the current pending legislation, but also with current practice uh, based on Supreme Court precedent and lower court precedent that some have interpreted uh, to deem this a constitutionally permissible practice. It's often been suggested by uh, several of my colleagues that it is the province of the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution and that statement is absolutely correct as far as it goes. But it's not the beginning of the analysis and the end of the analysis. We as U.S. Senators independently have an obligation, consistent with and required by our oath to the Constitution, which I took just a few months ago, just a few feet from where I stand now, to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And that means doing more than simply the full extent of whatever the courts will tolerate. In this instance, what we're talking about is the right of the U.S. military to detain indefinitely without trial a U.S. citizen simply on the basis that that person has been deemed an enemy combatant. Now, there is a real slippery slope problem here, and it's the very kind of slippery slope problem for which we have protections like the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment. You see, under the Fifth Amendment, a person can't be held for an infamous crime unless they've been subjected to a process whereby a grand jury indictment has been issued. And a person can't be held and tried for a crime without having counsel made available to them and without the opportunity for a speedy trial in front of a jury of the peers of the accused. We can scarce afford as Americans to surrender these fundamental civil liberties for which wars have been fought, for which the founding era, the founding generation fought so nobly against our mother country uh, to establish and thereafter to protect. We have to support these and I think at a bare minimum that means that we won't allow U.S. military personnel to arrest and indefinitely detain U.S. citizens regardless of what label we happen to apply to them. These people as U.S. citizens are entitled to a grand jury indictment to the extent that they're being held for an infamous crime. They're also entitled to a, a jury trial in front of their peers and to counsel. We cannot, for the sake of convenience, surrender these important liberties. I'm not willing to do that. That's why I support this amendment, Amendment Number 1126 to the pending legislation. I encourage each of my colleagues to do so. Now, I want to point out, Madam President, that yesterday I voted against uh, what became known as the Udall Amendment. Uh, I did so in part because I don't believe that that fixed the problem that I'm talking about here. The Udall Amendment didn't even purport to address current practice or uh, the, the policies as they've been established in recent years that this kind of detention is in some circumstances acceptable. It called for a study and it eliminated certain provisions in the proposed legislation, but it didn't fix the underlying problem. This Feinstein Amendment, Amendment Number 1126, does fix that. That's why I support it. I encourage each of my colleagues to do the same. When we take an oath to the U.S. Constitution to uphold it, to support it, to protect it, to defend it, we're doing more than simply agreeing to do whatever the courts will tolerate. We're taking an oath to the principles embodied in this 224-year-old document that has fostered the greatest civilization the world has ever known. Thank you, Madam President. I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
Uh, Mr. President, I'd ask that further proceedings under the quorum call. Without objection. Mr. President, let me just ask uh, Senator Merkley a question, and then uh, um, I think we can proceed from there. Uh, it's my understanding that the original language in this and related amendments had the dates 2012 and 2014 in them, and it could have been interpreted that you were trying to pre press those dates forward rather than address, as I interpret, your current amendment, the pace of reductions after consultation with the people that you have identified. Am, am I correct? Uh, the senator is correct. The amendment is designed to in, encourage to increase the, the pace of the reduction of U.S. forces and the transfer of responsibility to Afghanistan's forces. There's someone else here that wants to speak. Uh, I, I yield. I moved, moved the amendment. The question is on the amendment. As modified. As modified. There no further debate. If there's no further debate, all those in favor, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. No. The, the, the ayes appear to have it, and the ayes do have it. I move to reconsider. The amendment is modified as agreed to. I move to reconsider. Lay it on the table. Lay it on the table. I move to, mo to uh, lay that motion on the table. Got objection. Yeah. Senator from Michigan. The senator from New Hampshire. Senator from New Hampshire. Uh, Mr. President, the senator from New Hampshire had intended to talk about her amendment and withdraw it and uh, she may be coming. Uh, I have not had a chance to notify her, for, so there may be a couple minute uh, delay. Um, but uh, so I would have to suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. President. The Senator from Arizona. Question unanimous consent of further proceedings quorum without, without objection. objection. In a exchange that I had on the floor about, and I mentioned the wonderful long people and wonderful Long Island, I made a joke. I'm sorry that there's at least one of my colleagues that uh, can't take a joke, and so I apologize if I offended him and hope that someday he will have a sense of humor. 
I yield. Mr. President. The Senator from Alabama. Mr. President, I've been working for some time on, to wrestle with this question of the right number of military forces we need in Europe. It's uh, an issue that's given me some pause, and I thought we had an agreement several years ago to make some noticeable changes in that force structure. Some changes have indeed been made and others were in the works and they apparently have been put on hold and altered. So I just want to share some thoughts about it. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Levin and Senator McCain for working with me to develop uh, an amendment to this bill that uh, helps call attention to this problem with the Department of Defense. We've had a long and historic relationship with Europe and our European allies. They remain the best allies we have in the world. Uh, we have uh, large numbers of troops still in Europe, but they're not nearly as many as there have been in the past. Uh, but the numbers are still extraordinary. We have at this time 80,000 United States troops in Europe. And I don't believe military threats justify that large a troop presence. And our historic, even larger number, was based on the Soviet threat, uh, the folder gap, uh, the weakness of our European allies after World War II and, and their lack of strength and the bond that NATO meant. And we stuck together and transformed the entire North Atlantic region in a positive way. Um, a book has been written uh, uh, about where we are today called Paradise and Power, the essence of it, pretty significant book, frankly. The essence of it is that the Europeans uh, are in a paradise protected by American power. And they don't feel any need to substantially burden themselves with national defense because the United States is there. We have a nuclear presence. We have 80,000 troops. We have the fabulously trained, highly skilled military uh, with the lift capability of moving to a troubled and dangerous spot at any time. And I do think it's fair to say they've become a bit complacent. As part of uh, a CODEL that I led in 2004, we visited Europe because the United States was going through a BRAC, a reduction of United States basing, and uh, we didn't have the same type policy with regard to international bases, and we visited Senator Chambliss and Senator Enzi and I, uh, bases in Europe, particularly bases we felt would be enduring, uh, like Arota, Spain, and Siganella, and, and uh, Vincenza uh, and other bases in, in Ramstein in Germany. So, but there are others, lots of others. So, um, part of the NATO commitment is that each nation in Europe would invest and spend 2% of their GDP on defense. We have been 4%, sometimes over that recently. Uh, uh, as we've in recent years and so our NATO members however are falling below that. Uh, Germany, the strongest economy in Europe, Germany is at 1.2 percent of GDP on defense and they spend a large portion of that on short-term less than one year uh, military training of young people in Germany and the fact is that a nine-month trainee is not someone in the modern world you can send in the combat. They're just not sufficiently trained. Many military experts believe that this is just a waste of money. So even the money they're spending in many ways is not effectively and wisely spent to create the kind of modern military you have to have to be successful in, in serious matters. So we do though believe that Europe is 
not facing the kind of threats that we have. And I think it's appropriate uh, for us to talk to our European allies and say we want to proceed uh, with a drawdown uh, where possible. This nation is borrowing 40 cents of every dollar that we spend. The Defense Department under the sequester that will occur as a result of the failure of the Committee of Twelve to reach an agreement will be facing dramatic cuts in spending, over a trillion dollars based on President Obama's projected budget over ten years, and we need to look for every reasonable savings that we can. The Defense Department uh, is taking two heavier cuts, in my opinion, far more than any other department of government. However, uh, 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 we can't sustain that. I, I don't support that larger cut, but uh, it will be reducing spending by a significant amount. And so I believe we should uh, think about our foreign deployments. The National Defense Authorization Act represents a vision for defense spending. We're now down from $548 billion spent on the Defense Department last year to $527 billion this year, an actual reduction in non-inflation dollars of over $20 billion. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, Budget Control Act agreement calls for a reduction of total spending in the discretionary account this year of $7 billion, whereas the Defense Department is taking $20 billion. Other departments, therefore, are receiving increases to get the net seven that's claimed, and unfortunately, that's not an accurate number because we don't achieve even the seven billion dollars promised. Now, since 2004, the Defense Department had a plan to transfer two of its four highly trained combat brigades in Europe back to the United States as part of the larger post-World War uh, uh, realignment. Um, and, uh, however, in April of this year, the Department of Defense announced that it would maintain three combat brigades and not bring the fourth one home until 2015. I've asked uh, the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Dempsey, at the Armed Services hearing, and I asked Admiral Staff Reedus, our European UCOM commander, and they really had no good explanation for why we're altering the plan that's been in place. So my amendment has been agreed to on both sides and would require three things from the Department of Defense. Number one, assessment of the April 2011 decision to station three Army Brigade combat teams in Europe. Number two, an analysis of the fiscal and strategic cost and benefits of reducing the number of forward-based military personnel in Europe to that recommended by the 2004 Global Posture Review, and three, to describe the methodology used by the Defense Department to estimate the current and future cost of U.S. force uh, posture in Europe. So is Europe more threatened today than before? I don't think so. And the United States has got a tougher financial condition today than before? Yes. Uh, I believe that we need to look at this carefully. I thank Senator McCain and Senator Levin for working with me to recommend a, an amendment that they believe is consistent with the goals I'm seeking uh, without micromanaging the Department of Defense. So, Mr. President, I thank the Chair. I'm pleased that this amendment will be considered, and perhaps we uh, can make some progress to analyzing more properly the deployment of forces in Europe. And finally, I would say there is no doubt in my mind that the economy of the United States is benefited if a brigade is housed in the United States and the cost of support and families are in the United States strengthening our economy rather than transferring a wealth of our nation to a foreign area. And uh, I hope that we'll consider that as we deal with this issue. And I thank the chair and would yield the floor.
Mr. President. Senator from Arizona. Mr. President, I call up Amendment Number 1229 and ask for its immediate consideration. Clerk will report. This is the one. It's pending. The amendment is already pending. Uh, I note the presence of my colleague, Senator Lieberman, on the floor, the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, and we have had a discussion and a colloquy that I would uh, ask unanimous consent be included in the record at this time. Without objection. And I thank my friend from Connecticut for his support of this amendment and the importance with a full realization of the key role that the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee plays in the issue of cybersecurity, which is the most, in many respects, one of the most looming threat to our nation's security. Uh, Mr. President. <clears throat> I thank uh, my friend from Arizona. I, I appreciate uh, uh, this amendment that uh, he's offered, and, and I'm, uh, I believe I'm now listed as a co-sponsor. If not, I'd ask unanimous consent that I so, be so listed. Uh, this amendment uh, essentially codifies a very important memorandum of understanding between the Department of Homeland Security and the uh, NSA, the National Security Agency. Uh, this is, a, this is a perfect balance and exactly the kind of overcoming of, uh, of uh, uh, stovepipes that we need to see in our government. Uh, under existing law, the Department of Homeland Security has responsibility for protecting non-defense government, federal government cyberspace, cyber uh, networks, and the privately owned and operated uh, cyberspace, uh, which, uh, which actually amounts to uh, some of the most critical cyber infrastructure in our country is privately owned. And uh, today uh, uh, would be, as Senator McCain said, uh, uh, suggested a, a target of attack by an enemy wanting to do us harm by, uh, by attacking for, for instance, our uh, transit uh, systems, financial systems, electric grid, uh, and the like. And uh, uh, what, what, what is embodied in this memorandum of, un of understanding uh, between DHS and NSA, which we will, by this amendment, uh, codify into law, is to maintain the quite appropriate interface of, of the Department of Homeland Security with privately owned cyber infrastructure and those who uh, own and operate it yet utilizing the uh, unsurpassed capabilities of uh, NSA. Um, I appreciate that in this uh, uh, colloquy that Senator McCain are entering into, uh, we've both made clear, and I appreciate that he has, that his intention here is not, in, in offering this amendment, is not to circumvent the need for broader legislation to protect um, our, our cyberspace, our American cyberspace from theft, uh, from exploitation and from attack. It happens that the current occupant of the chair, the distinguished junior senator from Rhode Island, has really been a leader in this chamber in pushing us to deal with these kinds of problems. Senator Reid has uh, announced that, that he will bring a, uh, a comprehensive cybersecurity bill to the floor of the Senate uh, in the first work period of 2012. And that's very good news for our security. Uh, as Senator McCain said, I don't know that we today have a more serious threat to our security than that represented uh, by those who would do us harm uh, by attacking our, our cyber systems, both public and uh, private. So this colloquy makes clear that uh, this is a, a, a very significant first step, but that we need to do something more comprehensive, and we look forward to doing it on a bipartisan basis in the first uh, work period of 2012. Senator from Arizona. I want to thank the uh, Senator from Connecticut, my dear friend. And the amendment does establish a statutory basis for the memorandum of agreement between the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security on cooperative cybersecurity support. No one should have any doubt about how serious this issue is. Secretary of Defense Panetta testified in June 
Quote, next Pearl Harbor we confront could very well be a, a cyber attack. Former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, in hearing on 9-22, referred to the cyber threat as an existential threat to our country. So uh, th this is a very serious issue and one that, as the Senator from Connecticut just pointed out, is of utmost importance to our nation's security. And, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the colloquy between myself and the Senator from Connecticut appear as a, as a right joke immediately before the vote on this amendment. Without objection, it shall be so. Move the amendment. Is there further debate? If not, the question is on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. President. Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent to, uh, that Senator Lieberman and I be allowed to engage in a colloquy. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Obtaining intelligence from high-value terrorist detainees is an urgent national security priority that is essential to protecting Americans. Unfortunately, under current law, terrorists need look no further than the Internet to find out everything that they need to know about our interrogation practices and how they can circumvent them. Under the President's 2009 Executive Order uh, 13491, all U.S. government interrogations are limited to the interrogation techniques that are available online and prescribed in the Army Field Manual. As a result, all members of the intelligence community, including the non-Department of Defense intelligence professionals, who support the high-value detainee interrogation group must conform to the procedures of the Army Field Manual, which was written by the U.S. Army for the U.S. Army. That is, there is little flexibility permitted under these rules, and they are easy for those who want to harm us to circumvent them and to know exactly what techniques we will use to gather information to protect our country if they're detained as an enemy combatant. Would the uh, senator from New Hampshire yield for a question? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you. Uh, let, let me first thank my friend Senator Ayotte for uh, uh, assuming and carrying out such a leading uh, role in our debates on this critical issue of how uh, our country handles detainees and gathers intelligence in our war on terrorism. I share uh, her concerns about the potential damage to our intelligence collect collection efforts inflicted by adherence to the existing uh, restrictions on interrogators. And that's why uh, I'm pre pleased to be with others, a co-sponsor of the amendment she's introduced, which is amendment number uh, 1068. Uh, I will say that I'm also disturbed about the amount of misinformation that uh, seems to be circulating about this amendment and similar efforts in the past uh, that I've supported. So let me now ask the senator from New Hampshire, does uh, amendment number 1068 authorize torture? I thank my friend, the senator from Connecticut, uh, first of all, for his uh, leadership within this body on national security. And as uh, we both had the privilege of serving our states as the attorney general, of our states. And uh, I thank him for that question because the answer is no. Um, and this is an amendment I want to point out that not only is Senator Lieberman sponsoring this amendment, and I appreciate his experience and leadership uh, on these very most important national security issues, but Senator Chambliss, who is the vice chairman of the Intelligence Committee, as well as Senator Graham, Senator Cornyn, both members of the Armed Services Committee, as well as the Senate Judiciary Committee. It is very important to be clear about what this amendment would and would not do. This proposal takes every possible measure to put in place intelligence gathering practices that honor our American values and laws. Our amendment in no way condones or authorizes torture, and there have been many who have been trying to misrepresent which, uh, what is in this amendment. Any new interrogation techniques that are developed would be required 
to comply with the UN Convention Against Torture, the Military Commissions Act, the Detainee Treatment Act, as well as Section 2441 of Title 18 U.S. Code that relates to war crimes. Uh, I thank uh, my friend Senator Rayot for that clarification. It's very important and uh, uh, very, very critical, particularly for those who have misunderstood uh, this amendment, uh, to, to understand the host of uh, protections that the amendment uh, puts uh, in the both internet uh, compliance, compelling compliance with international conventions. Uh, against torture as well as uh, uh, explicit prohibitions in American law against interrogation uh, that amounts to torture. But I, I want to also ask my friend another question. Um, right now, all federal government interrogators, all interrogators, whether in the military or in the uh, civilian intelligence community, are limited to using the Army Field Manual. Uh, so, why do you think it's so critical to give interrogators the ability, this limited ability, to go beyond the Army Field Manual? Well, I appreciate the question from uh, my senator, the, my colleague from Connecticut. And the decision uh, by President Obama to limit interrogations to the Army Field Manual, manual was I believe based in part on the horrible abuses that occurred at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Undoubtedly, the abuses at Abu Ghraib failed to reflect American values, tarnished America's reputation, and certainly damaged, damaged our interests. However, responding to these abuses by reflexively applying an Army field manual, which, to be clear, the terrorists can go online and get and know exactly which techniques uh, they will be uh, subject to, uh, if captured, uh, to apply that to all federal government interrogators does not reflect the severity of the threat to our country and the importance of providing our non-military intelligence collectors all of the lawful tools that they need to gather intelligence uh, to prevent future attacks and to protect our country. Well, I, I thank uh, Senator Rayot for that answer, and uh, of course I completely agree um, with her. Uh, it's important to step back and just perhaps state the obvious. What, wh why do we capture uh, enemy combatants? Why, why do we take prisoners of war? Uh, there's really two reasons. Um, the one obvious one is to get them off the battlefield uh, against us so that they uh, can no longer uh, attempt to uh, uh, kill uh, Americans in uniform, and in the case of the, the war we're in with Islamist terrorists, to kill uh, civilians. That, that's the first goal, to get them off the battlefield. But the second goal is to gain, and it's, it's, this is a traditional um, a purpose of taking prisoners in war for as long as there has been warfare um, in human history, uh, all the more so now. The second purpose is to gather intelligence from them which will assist us in uh, defeating the enemy and protecting, achieving our goals, protecting the lives of our uh, men and women uh, in uniform. Uh, that traditional purpose for, for taking prisoners of war is all the more uh, critical in, in the unconventional war we're in against a, a, a brutal enemy that, that doesn't um, strike us uh, from uh, battleships uh, uh, or uh, um, uh, tactical air fighters or uh, uh, military tanks or even in uniform, but strikes us uh, from the shadows and strikes uh, civilians as well. So uh, I think it's, it's very important to approach this amendment understanding that we're trying to uh, increase in a reasonable way the capacity of those who work for us to protect our security and freedom to interrogate detainees that we have captured in uh, the war against terrorism. And one of the purposes is to gather intelligence which will help us protect the lives of, of, our, of Americans and uh, of our uh, allies. Uh, the preface to the Army Field Manual says, and I quote, 
uh, that it applies to the active army, the Army National Guard, the Army uh, uh, of, the, of the United States, and the United States Army Reserve unless otherwise stated, end quote. So that's from the field manual. Recognizing uh, that these words create limited applicability of the manual outside the Army, the Army Training and Doctrine Command um, authors had the wisdom to warn that this manual was Army doctrine. That, that is, the, the very authors have said, this is Army doctrine and would have to be adapted, uh, altered to apply to other military departments or other military services. So if the interrogation tactics in this manual are not ideally suited for military services other than the U.S. Army, why should civilian interrogation professionals in the intelligence community, and particularly those who are in support of the high-value detainee interrogation group, that is the group that gets the most serious, um, uh, mo most powerful, influential, dangerous uh, uh, prisoners of war, be forced to comply with a document written for a defined military uh, unit, which is the uh, U.S. Army. And so I ask uh, my friend from New Hampshire, that question. Well, I think it, I appreciate the question from the senator from Connecticut, and absolutely, as you pointed out, they shouldn't. The Army Field Manual was not created for this purpose, and as you've mentioned, the High Value Detainee Interrogation Group is an interagency group consisting of the CIA, FBI, and Defense Intelligence Agency, which is designed to interrogate the worst terrorists who are likely to have valuable information about future attacks and information we need to protect our country. Uh, to address this problem, what our amendment does is we drafted the amendment uh, to this authorization that would allow members of the intelligence community who are assigned in support of the high value detainee interrogation group to utilize interrogation techniques that are consistent with our laws and values, our amendment would ask the Secretary of Defense, working with the Director of National Intelligence and the Attorney General, to develop a classified annex that terrorists could not see. Unfortunately, now they can go right on the Internet and look at what techniques are going to be used. A classified annex to the Army Field Manual that would provide interrogation techniques that could be used by that important select group of intelligence gathering professionals to allow them to have at their use the techniques they need to protect Americans and to gather information to protect our country. Well, again, I thank my, my friend from New Hampshire. And I want to come back to something I said earlier. Uh, we've described here the purpose of this amendment, the what I'd call the due process that we've put into it, the, the, the mandate that it comply with existing international uh, norms and treaties and uh, obviously comply with our law. I want to ask my friend, um, none of the additional measures, well, let, let me put it this way. It is certainly not uh, our intention, and I ask you, uh, is it your intention, that none of the measures that we are authorizing here, interrogation tactics for the worst of the terrorist detainees, uh, should or could equal what is uh, 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 conventionally known as uh, torture. In other words, we're, we're not attempting to legalize torture with this amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Lieberman. No, we are not. Uh, we, uh, we believe uh, that torture violates our laws and runs counter to American values. That's what I believe. And that's why we specifically require that the techniques developed by the Secretary of Defense the Director of National Intelligence and the Attorney General have to comply with the UN Convention Against Torture and all applicable laws, including the Detainee Treatment Act. Thus, the ACLU's claim that the amendment threatens to revive the use of torture uh, is patently false, unfortunately. Currently, the Army Field Manual interrogation techniques that our intelligence community interrogators must follow are publicly listed online. That's unacceptable. This would be like the New England Patriots giving their opponents their playbook days or weeks before the game begins. In my experience, Two or three minutes. as Attorney General of New Hampshire and as a murder pr prosecutor, no detective or cop 
uh, just in a common criminal case, would tell the criminals what uh, techniques they're going to use to gather information. Mr. President, could I ask my friend from New Hampshire to allow me to ask a unanimous consent request? Uh, Mr. President, I would grant that request. Thank you. Uh, the majority Leader is right. Mr. President, I would ask, you know, the reason that Senator Levin and I have a briefing, uh, and a classified briefing that starts at 5.30, so I'd ask unanimous consent that following the statement of the Senator, the Senator from New Hampshire listening, uh, how, mu how much longer are you going to speak? It doesn't matter, just so I have... Uh, I, I would uh, say, Leader, that probably five minutes. Okay. So, Mr. President, I would ask you to announce consent that following uh, her statement of ten minutes, because uh, she's been around long enough that she's learned to keep senators' time. Five minutes really isn't five minutes. Uh, does the senator from uh, Connecticut wish to speak? Uh, I'm, uh, Mr. President, I'd say to the leader, I'm in this with the senator from New Hampshire, okay. so we're, we're, we'll complete our colloquy within the ten minutes. So, following the colloquy in ten minutes, I ask that this, uh, the Senate proceed to a period of morning business for one hour. Following that, that uh, they go, we go back to the defense authorization bill. Is there uh, objection? There will be no more votes this evening, though, Mr. President. Without objection. And I express my appreciation to my friend from New Hampshire. Senator from New Hampshire. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and, and I, th I thank, thank our leader for giving us the opportunity to continue this colloquy. I just wanted to point out that uh, we were talking about the fact that the Army Field Manual is online, and my experience as an Attorney General, I know that my colleague served as Attorney General as well, uh, prior to that I was a murder prosecutor, and uh, no detective or cop on the beat uh, would, in a common criminal case, and we're dealing with a situation where we're at war with terrorists, would ever give a criminal their playbook as to what techniques they would use to question them to get information to see if a crime is committed and to see that justice is served. And we're in a situation where we have online the techniques from the Army Field Manual uh, when we're at war with terrorists who want to kill us. And so what we're saying with this amendment is that we need to allow the intelligence professionals to develop techniques put in a classified annex consistent with our laws uh, that would allow them to gather intelligence and not tell uh, the enemies, our enemies, uh, what techniques will be used to gather information against them. Not surprisingly, Al-Qaeda terrorists have taken advantage of our willingness to tell them publicly on the Internet what, we will, what will and won't happen during the interrogation should they be captured. Al-Qaeda terrorists have familiarized themselves with interrogation techniques they would confront if captured, and they're training on how to respond. And that makes it more difficult for us to gather information. The United States' willingness to give the equivalent of interrogation cliff notes to terrorists places uh, our interrogators at a disadvantage and makes it more difficult to gather information we need to save American lines, lives. So developing a classified annex of lawful techniques for intelligence professionals who are interrogating the worst terrorists would make it harder for terrorists to train to avoid and resist interrogation. The key to our amendment is giving this limited group of intelligence community, inter community interrogators the techniques they need to gather information, but to do so without restoring to torture, uh, resorting to torture and while retaining an operational advantage that makes it more likely that an interrogation will be successful. Mr. President, I thank the Senator from New Hampshire. Uh, just listening to her uh, just seems so unacceptable that we're basically telegraphing to our enemy exactly what the range of t uh, tactics we will use against them uh, 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 as part of the interrogation. I mean, we've set some, some quite appropriate constraints here in this amendment consistent with our values and our laws and international law. That we're, we're not going to get anywhere near torture, but when a, when a member of Al-Qaeda or, or a similar associated terrorist group is captured, I want that person to be terrified about what's going to happen to them in American custody. I, I want them uh, not to know what's going to happen. I want that, that, that the terror that they inflict on others to be felt by them as a result of the uncertainty of not knowing that they can look 
uh, on the Internet and find exactly uh, what our interrogators are going to be limited to. Uh, and again, we're, we, we, we will not tolerate torture. We will not tolerate what happened at Abu Ghraib. I think the, the limiting interrogation to the Army Field Manual was an understandable but excessive um, reaction to the extreme and unacceptable behavior by Americans at Abu Ghraib. And I, I, I hope this amendment uh, will facilitate a return to a, a kind of sensible middle ground uh, on which um, um, we will not be shackling our interrogators as they try to get intelligence within the law to protect our freedom and the safety of those who are fighting for us. So um, I wanted to uh, ask my friend from New Hampshire um, whether she thinks that we've now got a kind of one-size-fits-all approach to interrogation that's uh, uh, posted online. Uh, in other words, our law should make uh, it easier within the law, not harder, to gather intelligence to keep Americans safe. And yet it seems that the current policy actually runs counter to that basic principle. Does my